kitchen. The police, meanwhile, says calm has been restored to the area. Also this afternoon, Russian embassy here in Ghana refutes details. They facilitated the procurement of flags for the Diabene March in support of mercenary group Wagner. The embassy says they notified authorities of the protest. We get details for you shortly. And more details from OSP charge sheet as to how former sanitation minister Cecilia Dapa made questionable deposits into a Prudential Bank City and dollar account far in excess of her lawful income. A bit more as the OSP adds, Madame Dapa simply refused to speak to the sources of the funds. Much later, the minority in parliament, they are alleging government plans to collateralize the 10 oil fields to receive some $431 million from the Tasco for the next five years. The NDC group is demanding a halt to the plans. Details of these stories a lot more if you stay with us for the next 30 minutes. A pleasure that you could be a part of this afternoon's bulletin. It's streaming live on Facebook. Our handles 3FM927. Same handles on Twitter as well. 3FM927. I am Eric Mawina Egbeta. And we're going to be beginning from here in Accra, Taifa Junction, to be specific, because one person has reportedly died and four others in critical condition following a riot at Muse near Taifa Junction this morning. The incident was sparked by an attempt to evict merchants at the timber village by a landlady who reportedly stormed the place with land guards. The th things got out of hand as the timber dealers resisted uh, the eviction by mounting roadblocks. Their action spilled onto the Akran Sawam Highway crossing a gridlock. The police moved in to control the situation but one person is said to have been shot uh, during uh, the process and Gordon Asiniba is my colleague he will join us shortly uh, with a bit more details as to exactly what it is uh, that has been happening and we'll hear from him and the developments there shortly but another matter uh, which is developing end of interest this afternoon uh, has to do with the Russian embassy in Ghana and its response to uh, the new story we broke to you in collaboration with Ghana Fact about the presence of uh, infiltration of Wagner mercenaries, a protest which was staged at Diabene in the western region. Well, the Russian embassy says it has no connection with organizers of the protests and the march which was held at Diabene in the western region in support of the Wagner Group and the Russian Federation. A statement by the embassy said that upon receipt in August of an information about a public action being plotted, the embassy immediately appealed to the Ghana Police Service and warned about the possible organization of the rally with the use of the national symbols of the Russian Federation. Further said the embassy was neither involved in spreading Russian flags, shirts and placards among the protesters nor in establishing any uh, contact with the possible sponsors including those abroad. My colleague Martin Asedu Data, he's joining me in studio with a bit more details uh, with regards to this development. Martin, you skimmed through the statement. Uh, first of all, let's start with what more it says. Right, so the statement, uh, and good afternoon to our listeners, um, uh, Eric. So uh, the statement goes out, uh, it's a one-pager, about uh, six paragraphs, and it's straight to the point that they have um, been alerted about the local media publication of a pro-Russian demonstration uh, which took place in the western region on the 13th of August. And they are saying that, first of all, they need to clarify that they have no connection whatsoever with the demonstration and that the embassy is not involved in any such plan to undertake such a protest or a demonstration in Ghana. So the specifics include the fact that they say they got wind of something like this likely to happen in August and uh, alerted the Ghana Police Service and warned about a possible organization of a rally with the use of the national symbols of the Russian Federation. Mm. And that's, that's uh, you know, interesting to note where the Russian embassy in Ghana 
is the one that alerted the Ghana police that such a demonstration was going to happen and Russian emblems or Russian symbols were going to be used, which meant that they themselves thought that it was concerning for the police administration to pay attention to. And they go on to say that it should be noted that the embassy was not involved neither in spreading of the Russian flags, the shirts, placards, etc. among the uh, protesters, nor in establishing any contact with the possible sponsors of the unrest, including those ones from abroad. The embassy is confident that the Ghanaian law enforcement will take the necessary measures to identify all those involved in their incident and um, the courts will also uh, take the appropriate decisions to bring the perpetrators to book in conclusion. So the, the statement is actually uh, dated the 20th of September, today. which is actually today. Mm. So they are saying that uh, because Russia uh, is, signed, is a signatory to the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations and other international obligations, their focus is to build mutual respect um, relations with the Ghanaian people and also ensure the interest of both countries and their citizens so they are just dissociating themselves mm. totally from what happened in Takrati. just uh, briefly a bit more details as to what looks like uh news or information that seeks to uh, suggest otherwise by these organizers and groupings which were in contact with this one Michael Esiedu individual. Um, we've come across uh, some details in that light. What specifically does it say? Right, so there is this podcast that is, um, he's been, it's been running for some time now and uh, the information we uh, have regarding the content on that podcast shows that this discussion about a group planning to do a Russian a pro-Russian protest in mm. Ghana had been in the offing for some time now. And it was this group, in fact, the podcast presenter said in that podcast that he called the Ghanaian, um, the Russian embassy in Ghana mm. to find out from them whether they were aware of this uh, protest that was happening. In fact, the content of the podcast simply is in support of right. Russia and then pro-Russian uh, agenda, saying that they need Russia to do more in Africa and to ensure the security of the citizenry, specifically against the Western um, powers who are also playing a role in, 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 in Africa. So they are simply saying that they knew about it. They were the ones that drew the attention of the Russian embassy to it. They and in the podcast, it goes on to say that they did not know, mm. uh, the, the Russian embassy, embassy in Ghana no, did no. not know that something like that was going to happen. So they drew their attention to it. And maybe we should get the Ghana police service to also listen to this podcast because it primarily just talks in detail of why they think Russia is the best bet for the continent mm. and that they should find a way of coming and doing more in Africa. So I would uh, give further details of w what's, uh, what's been happening mm. w on this particular story in subsequent bulletins. That's Martin Asiru, that's my colleague here at 3FM TV3, provided a bit more details as to that statement from the Russian embassy and the nuance in relation to what it is that we have seen here at 3FM and what the Russian embassy has been seeing as well. But I mentioned that one person has been shot dead and four others in critical condition following what was expected to be an ejection of some uh, timber traders. Gordon Asidiba has been on the beat since morning, joins us with, in uh, VAR phone uh, with a bit more details. Godwin, you've been to the area, been speaking to the resident. What have you been able to glean as to what caused the clashes this morning? All right, Mawena, um, we know that in the early hours of Wednesday, which is today, September 2023, uh, there was a shocking incident that unfolded at a uh, community around Taipa Junction. And this unsettling event um, revolved around a contentious parcel of land um, with tensions escalating between two parties, namely um, Eugenia Akwete, who um, we have been told is the owner of the land and the residence. So reports suggest that um, the situation took a perilous turn as alleged land guards besieged the premises, opening fire on residents. And tragically, one individual who fell victim to a gunshot wound around his armpit succumbing to the injury um, was pronounced dead. Additionally, we know that four 
others have sustained injuries and are currently receiving medical treatment at a hospital. And in response to the escalating crisis, the police swiftly dispatched a, a police patrol team to the area in the bit to restore order and calm amidst the chaos. And um, as far as all of this has happened, you could clearly see that the residents were disturbed because they have been telling me that the owner of the land, who is uh, Eugenia Pete, actually sent in people to come and take money from them because they had rented portions of the land that they have mounted their, their structures on. And this woman just came in this morning claiming that the people should vacate the premises without mm. giving them some particular time to be able to prepare and move. Now, the chairman for Moose, Akobi Ashanti, who has been speaking to me and has claimed to you, has been among those who have been shot, has been shedding light on the circumstances leading to this morning's tragic incident around Haifa. So let's take a listen to what we have to say. A receipt. Which means somebody even paid his rent yesterday. So you cannot say today, Wednesday, you are trying to pull everything, all the structures, all the stores, all the containers down. So were you here when the shooting incident happened? Did you witness it? This morning? Yes. Yes, I was. What exactly happened? What, what happened was she brought land gas, totally about 30. They brought five cars. Afterwards, we saw policemen coming. We, we told, we asked them, what is happening? Why are they here? They said, the lady has contracted them to come and uh, pull everything down. And they said, no, we can't, let, we can't sit down, let this thing happen. Because we rent it from her. We are paying rent. She has not sat down with us to tell us that she's coming to pull everything down. We have agreement with her. We are paying the rent. So that's the market leader uh, speaking to my colleague Gordon Asidiba who was on the phone with us uh, a while earlier and you're listening to the news here on 3FM 92.7 and let's bring you some other stories because a special prosecutor has alleged that former sanitation minister Cecilia Benadapa made questionable deposits into both her city and dollar account with Prudential Bank exceeding limits of her lawful income. According to the charge sheet of the OSP who's seeking a court confirmation of the seizure of assets, the former sanitation minister simply refused to speak to the sources of the funds. The OSP has filed fresh charges at the High Court uh, seeking to confirm the freezing of the asset. Well, for a private legal practitioner, the OSP has put his best foot forward in this particular case. Um, I, I believe that the OSP has put his best foot forward um, to make sure that there is no doubt in the mind of the judge that there's a prima facie reason on the face of it, there's a reason why the account should remain frozen until the investigations are completed. So it is on notice, so Madam Cecilia, the press lawyer, will be served, and they have an opportunity to respond and depose to facts and evidence that may cast doubt as to the credibility of the documents and the facts or depositions contained in the OSP's application. Right. Now, I would not want to prejudice the outcome of the application, but the judge would be seized with all the documents and all the evidence, and I believe that the judge will make a fair conclusion based on the evidence that are put before him or her. That's private legal practitioner Bobby Banson speaking there, and we're seeking to subject this to a bit more analysis. We'll try and get a bit more for you but staying with the office of the special prosecutor they are pushing for new regulations to uh, oversee and confiscate unexplained wealth by politicians and individuals of interest the unexplained wealth order and the non-conviction base for future regulation according to the osp a part of the efforts to strengthen the fight against graft head of research and administration at the osp summit daco says the order will not only reduce corruption but will also be a direct provision for anti-graft institutions and law enforcers to fight corruption he's been speaking at a round table uh, conversation on corruption we at the OSP think that in amendment of our 
Criminal and Other Offenses Act um, at 29, and also a possible amendment of the Office of the Special Prosecutor Act uh, are, are very eminent. And one of them is that we, we like the country to have a direct provision of what we call unexplained wealth order. Um, if you take any of the uh, of the African countries that are uh, leading in the fight against corruption, you realize that, let's take Kenya for instance, they have a direct provision on what we call unexplained wealth order, so that the burden is shifted onto the suspect or the accused, rather than on the law enforcement agency or the anti-corruption board, so that they need to prove how they came by their sort of wealth. As it stands now, we have provisions in the OSP Act that allows us to do lifestyle audit. But by and large, the burden still remains with the prosecutor. And as you know, corruption is between two people who are willing to let you know what has happened. It is not like fraud or even murder. And uh, we've always said that one of the difficult offenses to prove in the world is corruption and not the other offenses as well. The second proposal is what we call the non-conviction based forfeiture. And that allows you to, um, you don't have to necessarily have to go to trial or charge someone before you can forfeit the assets of the person that has been gotten illegally. That's Samir Daku. He is uh, Head of Research and Administration at the Office of the Special Prosecutor. Meanwhile, the Commissioner of the uh, of Shuraj, that's the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice, uh, Dr. Joseph Wittar, he's charged the Attorney General and Cabinet to uh, master the political will to pass into law the conduct of public officers' bill and the Criminal Offences Amendment Bill of 2021. I would like to strongly urge the executive and in particular the attorney general and cabinet to master the political law to put before parliament for passage into law two very important innovations in the anti-corruption legal framework in that which will serve as a domestication of the AUC PCC and Ankar for now. We have the conduct of the public officer bill and the criminal offenses amendment bill 2021. The conduct of public officers bill better known in the public domain, but in my view, the criminal offenses amendment bill, the, the attorney general has consulted stakeholders on for input lesser known but equally very important in the light of the, the domestication of the African Union Convention for the Prevention and Combat of Corruption in Ghana. As Dr. Joseph Wittal, he is the Commissioner of Shraj. You're listening to the news here on 3FM 92.7. Back to the capital and to some concerning news and homes of residents at Osu, close to the castle here in the capital Accra, have been flooded by the sea and the Clote Lagoon. The residents have blamed the development on the sea defense wall on one part of the the sea. Joseph Armstrong visited the area is joining me in studio with a bit more details. Yeah. Armstrong, uh, you were there. What exactly did you see when you visited the area? Yeah, when I, when I got there, the first thing I saw was uh, sea water entering into the homes of these uh, residents and uh, mm. precisely uh, right at the back of the Osu Castle, that place is called Osu Aneho. And uh, you could see the people have also built very close to the sea and the lagoon. I think they've virtually taken the space of the lagoon, uh, which is why the little pressure from the sea, it ends up in their homes. But then the residents are also blaming this uh, recent flood on the, the, uh, the, 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 what, they, what they call a, a harbor, but it's not a harbor, it's a sea breaker. That is like a sea defense that they've constructed uh, at one side of the See, so for them, they believe that until that sea defense was created there or was constructed along that area, such thing like the seawater coming to their homes has never happened before. And this is the very first time 
they are witnessing this. So they are calling on the assembly to uh, see today that they take the sea breaker from the sea. I went to the assembly to see if I could get the assembly authorities to talk to, but I'm told all the heads of the department, including the MC, they've gone into a meeting and we couldn't get them to talk to. Let's hear from the resident and perhaps we tr help translate exactly the, what it is they told you when you visited the community. I mean, I don't know what farm. I'm a shaman of farm. I'm very well for one farm, you fool. One minute, a quack of cry beer. I'm much a boy, boy, but never he be in Calibina. I'm a fair with you, but never he be. I am a to fair pa. Look about to live to fair pa. Now, my mom, come up with the Babano. I took a hope. Can't get better than a couple of circles. So I'm strong. Oh, I'm a fool. I could not know any. I did. I'm a vessel one or me come. I'm not a power. I'm a tissue. I know how be a man. I'm going to make you. Okay. Thank you. 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 So I'm just gleaning that they are reiterating that sea defense project, but there was one woman who appeared to have some really pressing things on her chest and wanted to say. Yeah, that. yeah. For her, she's concerned about how uh, she called them strangers that have taken over the place. They've built all the way into the Kuali Lagoon area, and uh, she's very angry. And she's saying that the authorities in that area needs to come and uh, demolish all those buildings that. Uh, it's preventing the flow of the water back into the clothy uh, lagoon and uh, that's why she was saying that yes uh, they've taken over their our land and they are not giving us any working space uh, basically that's what he's saying and the second person was talking about the fact that they've built a harbor which is of of course the sea defense and that is causing the flooding that has happened but i think it's a uh, it's an issue that needs to be looked at because if you look at it closely you realize that gradually the usu castle is being washed away by the sea and unless uh, the ghana tourism board is still interested in uh, the osu castle again then they can leave it for the sea to wash it or if not they need to do something to safeguard the osu castle i'm strong many thanks for those details that's i'm strong code along with my colleague who visited the osu area with a bit more details to the minority now because they are demanding an immediate halt to plans by the government to allegedly offer proceeds from the 10 oil field as collateral for the next five years in receipt or some 431 million dollar loan facility from letasco the